All right, hello and welcome everybody. We will just take a couple of moments to allow for a few more people to get on board, get comfortable, get relaxed, wherever you are. Uh, and thank you for joining us on the final episode of Entrepreneur with Dessert. Um, we're very excited because tonight we have a very special guest, Harley Alexander, my man to my right, <laughs> who is going to be giving us all things tech, exciting things, and, and uh, we're very happy to have him here today. Do not forget, for those of you who are on right now, you can submit questions. We encourage you to submit questions uh, by the, the chat function on Zoom. So fire them away, and we will definitely get towards them very shortly. Um, and so, no further ado, uh, let us begin. Harley Alexander, my, my, my dear friend here, um, he is a UX and UI designer, uh, and he also is the director of, of a very successful agency. So let's get started. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Before we hear about all the cool things that are kind of happening in your world, mm -hmm. let's take it. Let's take it back for the audience. Tell Absolutely. us a little bit about what you thought you were going to be doing when you were, say, fifteen years of age. Definitely, um, I was actually already working by the time I was fifteen. Um, probably rewind it even a bit more. Let's take it back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Like, um, when I was younger, probably around like. I got my first computer when I was like six or seven okay. and I always knew that I wanted to do something with computers because I was just obsessed. Like my parents had to like take it out of my room when I went to sleep because otherwise I'd just stay up like playing Sims. Um, and then around uh, 10, 11 years old, I started getting into like Photoshop and like making crazy backgrounds on, nice. for my computer. Yeah. And um, yeah, then about 12, I started really getting interested in like websites and um, that's when it all really sort of kicked off from there. The passion purely really evolved from there. Yeah. That's cool. But I, I also am well aware that you are a published author. Yeah. And you did that at a very early age. Yeah. Please talk to us about that. Sure. That was actually really lucky, sort of like right place, right time kind of thing. Yeah. So around about when I was 13, I'd figured out this like fantastic scheme for earning money from home. Um, and coupled it with like, you know, my passion for websites. So um, I wanted to learn how to build Photoshop websites, oh, sorry, WordPress websites, yeah. and um, how to like learn tools like jQuery and CSS and that sort of thing. So um, what I did was I'd like come up with an idea of what I wanted to learn, learn how to do it, and then rewrite it into an article. And wow. um, so yeah, that was about 13 when I started doing that. And um, yeah, I'd write like a tutorial, it was like a step one, write this code, step two, write this code, and you'd end up with like, I don't know, like a newspaper layout. And um, yeah, so that's how it started. And um, at the time, uh, Collis Tade, who's uh, CEO of Invito, okay. um, he was editing the website because it's like under his umbrella of um, tutorial sites. And I had this idea for like a four-part A to Z WordPress um, series. So I... Um, Took it to him and I was like, hey, Carlos, I've got this, uh, you know, four-part series, but it's going to cost you because they're like 250 US uh, article. And I um, explained it to him and he was like, yeah, that sounds good. You can do it if you want. But um, I'm actually writing a book about WordPress and I've done like the first half of design. Um, but because I'm managing all these sites, I can't do the other half. Um, do you want to do it? And I, I was his 13-year-old. Just given that opportunity right there. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And, and we'd never like met face to face. Like I was purely just chatting over email and that sort of thing. So he had no idea that I was like a 13-year-old sitting behind my computer. <laughs> and awesome. um, yeah, so that's how it started. And it wasn't until we like went to meet to like sign the legal documents that he was like, how old are you? <laughs> and, Starts breaking out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was very lucky. And um, really writing a book for me then wasn't, that like challenging because it was just like writing a tutorial but a really long one. Right. Um, so yeah, I wrote like four chapters and each one was like a really long tutorial. Like today we're going to build a portfolio website and then the next chapter was like a um, you know corporate website and that sort of thing. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, I also was very entrepreneurial at your age. I'm pretty sure I was just washing cars. So <laughs> not quite writing books but like there I was scrubbing the wheel. So now I feel That's like... That's it. That's it. <laughs> <doing it all. laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, awesome. Awesome. Um, I guess for many people potentially on this, a lot of the, the young ones, but maybe the old ones like myself, who are, give us what is a UX design? What is a UI designer? Tell What do those terms mean, full stack developer? Yeah, definitely. So UX designer, there's probably like a group of like designers. Okay. Um, there's user experience designers. Um, there's service designers. Um, there's visual designers. Uh, conversational design is a sort of new discipline that's coming around All right. and really it's about how like humans interact with the tools that we build. Mm -hmm. um, so UX is really like 
before there's anything pretty, like nice colors or anything. It's like winding it back, and it's like the skeleton of a website, for example, or an app. Okay. Um, so UX designers, before they even put like pen to paper to start drawing what a website will look like, um, they do a lot of research into you know why it's going to look like this. Um, so yeah, they can do a lot of uh, interviews with the potential customers for the product that they're building. Um, they can sort of look at past case studies, find patterns, see what's been working. Um, and yeah, and so that sort of like informs the entire process from the start because it's uh, sort of in the user experience phase where you come up with things called user stories. Okay. And so a user story might be like, uh, in the example of Uber, is, um, you know, I want to book a car to get somewhere. Okay. Um, so you do it in a structure, it's like, um, I don't know, as a citizen, I want to book a car in order to get to where I need to be. And so that story like is like drives the process all the way through design and developing the app and actually launching it. And um, it also gives them a reference point at the end to sort of say, hey, has this been successful? Because they can look at the product that they've built in the end and go back to the user story and um, say, yes, that person. So it sounds like well, it's almost like the map or the blueprint. Yeah, it blueprint. Like. Perfect, perfect yeah, word for it. Cool. Yeah. Um, and it's really broad, so like there's all these different types of research, there's persona generation, there's wireframing, prototyping, um, as I mentioned there's conversational design as well, so traditionally with UX it's like how does a person interact with this app, mm -hmm. um, but with the sort of advent of uh, you know, chatbots and personal assistants, um, there's no interface anymore, like the interface is the voice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's how do you, you know, design that experience so that uh, it's easy for a person to do, you know, what they need to achieve. Right. Yeah. Well, that makes complete sense. So, so, the way that I'm picturing now is like all those times I've had great apps or apps that aren't awesome. I, I can think, well, whoever was doing the blueprint for this, yeah, yeah, did a great job, or did an awesome job because yeah. it's easy to navigate. You know, does all the things I want to do. Yeah. Thank you for but like, shedding light on that. Like, yeah. How it all works. Like nine times out of ten, if you download an app and it's a really poor experience, chances are it's a developer that's design like design the app because they yeah. just haven't thought about any of this stuff at all right. so it's really like a like you know you need one for the other okay. um, otherwise you know the end results not going to be very good cool. yeah and so full stack developer what, what is, yep. what's that about yeah so there's front-end developers and back-end developers so front-end yeah. developers um, build like what you see so like all the buttons and interactions and animations and that sort of thing um, and then a back-end developer does like the database management and uh, like a API which allows the front end to talk to the database, um, but then a full stack developer is someone who can do the sort of full stack. So like the front end, the back end, tie them both together. Um, and that's becoming really valuable now because um, as these products get more and more complex, you either have to hire more people to do all these jobs um, and they don't necessarily understand all the moving parts from either side. So full stack developer knows that um, because they've got this button on the front end, the back end has to look like this. Um, whereas in the past, you know, back-end devs build it how they think it needs to be built, which is very technical, and it is like one possible way, but it might not ne necessarily be what's like good for the front-end developer to use. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. That's also good to know, like if you're going through CVs and see full-stack developer, it's like, yeah. get this person on board. And then uh, we call a unicorn uh, someone who's got everything, so full-stack and UX, UI, visual designer, everything. Unicorn. Yeah. Okay. Write that one down. Yeah. That's important. Um, I think that, you know, we're obviously in an extremely exciting period mm -hmm. in our lives. There is amazing technologies everywhere we look. Yep. I, 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 I mean, I know what I think may happen in the future, but it could be just because I've watched a lot of sci-fi. But in your opinion, like someone who's really in the space, what can we expect to see? Um, AI is going to take over the world. <laughs> No, not, first. not in a bad it, way. From the professional. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in a bad way. Um, yeah. So AI um, sort of allows us to do what you know humans would do in a certain way, okay. um, artificial intelligence. Um, so things like, uh, how do I explain it? Looking at a group of pictures um, that somebody likes and then, um, so say for example, you know, you were looking at cars and you looked at, you know, 10 sports cars and you were like, I like those. The AI could be like, okay, well, there's 10 sports cars. Have you thought about this sports car? Um, so, which is traditionally something like a salesperson would do, right? They'd be okay. like, because you've seen these, you like these, you probably like this one. Yeah. Um, and that's just one example. So it's really about like, you know, crunching all the data that, you know, we're generating and making sense of it. So this year alone, 2017, we've made... Um, 
we've created more data than uh, the past 5,000 years combined, including 2016 and 15 and everything. It's like hard to comprehend. Yeah, like the numbers it's, are just it's ridiculous. Staggering, right? Yeah, and um, I think like next year it'll be like the past 5,000 doubled or tripled just because there's so much data just coming out of everything. And that really created an opportunity for people to be like, okay, what can we do with this data outside, you know, what we normally do? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think what we're going to like find in the future is that because um, our data can be understood without humans having to analyze it, it's actually going to improve our lives a lot. Um, you know, you're going to, product recommendations are typically annoying because it's like, why are you trying to sell me more crap? Yeah. Um, but um, with AI, it's actually like meaningful. Like it's been looking at, you know, 5,000 other people who look like you and who have your shopping habits and yeah. looking at what they buy and sort of matching, you know, th products that they might have, might have bought to you. Sounds like the credit cards are going to get a real working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not already, but cool. Okay. Interesting. Um, one of the things that we've been kind of toying up here at Desir is, you know, we want to incorporate um, VR somehow, mm -hmm. but nice. we're adding into, into what we do. And yep. um, we've got a few ideas. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, like what kind of industries do you think will really start to embrace that kind of technology? Definitely. So I think there's, there's a few different types. There's virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, so virtual reality is like full immersion where, you know, you've got headphones on and you've got a screen that covers your eyes. You can't see anything around you. Yeah. Um, and I think that's going to be really huge for like the entertainment industry. So watching movies uh, instead of like sitting in your seat, you can sort of like look around and um, it's got spatial audio. So when you look around, the sound still comes from over here, even though you've got your headphones on. Yeah. Um, it's probably got a lot of healthcare applications. So um, I don't know, people dealing with depression or um, improving the quality of life for people who can't leave their bed. You know, they can chuck on a VR headset and be in... I don't know, sunny paradise, even though they're sitting in a hospital somewhere. Um, but then AR is the one that really interests me. Um, and that's got like implications for both consumers and, um, you know, uh, professional industries. So for consumers, it's great because I don't know, it's really novel. Have you played around with any AR things on like an iPhone X? No, I haven't had the chance yet. It is absolutely incredible how like how much you believe it's there and you look at someone like playing with it and then you're like, you look like an idiot, like, you know, yeah, <laughs> cause yeah. they're like moving this phone around like a blank space, but then you actually use it and uh, yeah, it just looks like it's actually there. Um, so that's going to be huge for like advertising and you know, just fun experiences and that sort of thing. I just keep thinking Pokemon Go, is that like something similar in any way? Yeah, 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 no way off. definitely. So uh, technology has actually come a long way since then. So okay. Pokemon Go sort of rolled their own AR stuff. Yeah. And Apple have just released AR Kit, which sort of like brings it to the masses. So anyone with an iPhone has like you know extremely high caliber, like locate like space tracking. So um, the developers can you know, create really strong experiences with it. Cool. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be huge. And like Snapchat, um, like uh, lenses, I think they call them, is when you're like looking at it, like overlays something over your face and like tracks your face. Um, so that's like novel and fun. And emoji is really cool too. I don't know if you play with that. Yeah, I know of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can like track your face looking like yeah. an animal yeah. and an emoji. Yeah. Um, but then when it comes to like professional industries, um, that's what I think it's really going to change the game. Um, so a chef could sort of look around the kitchen with his AI glasses on and see, you know, we've got like five burgers left over there and, um, you know, salad that's 30% ready and they can just get like a really, they, they can just gather like more knowledge about the world around them based on this augmented reality. Mm -hmm. Um, another way would be, I don't know, in a factory, they can sort of look around at the production line and see what's where and who, how long someone's been on. So if they need a break, um, it's like a good way to track it. Um, and then the last one would probably be education. I saw this amazing video on LinkedIn where, um, it was these, uh, people in like a, um, medical class and they had like the human brain on an AR device and they like went like that and the brain like exploded and all the parts sort of separated so no you can way. like look at them individually and like yeah. go really close. Yeah, so it's a, it's a huge world out there and there's like so much possibility but I don't think like the hardware to actually achieve that is there yet. Yeah. They're really trying hard but it's not quite there. Like VR yeah. still looks like a, you know, 90s Nintendo 64 video game. I love the 64. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, look, I think that it's, I mean, it's exciting though, right? The things that will happen in the future, I think the, mm. the speed in which we will, like some of the things you just touched on then, the ability for us to fix problems quicker, to be able to service, whether it be clients, customers, or just your own workplace better, it sounds like it's going in that direction. So when it gets there and it's working, amazing, right? Yeah. 
Um, one of the things that I've experienced a little bit recently, I know that you've, you're you a big fan, is the, the chat bot space. Yeah. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that's like the, and you'll explain this a lot better than I will, yeah. but it's uh, the little screen that will pop up on your screen when you're, when you're uh, on the internet or give you assistance. With it. It's like a virtual assistance is yeah. kind of a good way to put it, right? Yeah. Um, and I only just literally last week had Tell my me. first real experience with it. Tell me about it. Well, I was um, on an airline site and I was trying to track one of my bookings because the email didn't come through that I, I was supposed to receive for the confirmation. Mm -hmm. And up pops the screen and it's, there's this digital person there saying, how can I help? And I was so skeptical. I was like, first of all, I was like, you don't know me. Like, <laughs> yeah. questions, you know? you're just a robot. <laughs> exactly. And, but with, you know, like one sentence, what I required all there. And like, I was, I was kind of like, it's a little bit frightening how easy and simple that was and yeah. the fact that I know there wasn't anyone behind a computer typing those answers. But yeah. you tell me about it from your perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's not, not even just on a website. It's across any messaging platform. So like Facebook, WhatsApp, Kick, Instagram. Yeah. There's, there's about like 30 major ones, I think. And um, sort of like the pretext of this is that uh, last year, um, the top four messaging apps active users actually surpass the top four social platforms. So there's more people sitting on Messenger and WhatsApp and all of these than like Facebook and MySpace. What are some other social networks? LinkedIn. Um, yep, yep, yeah. definitely. Um, so yeah, people are spending like a lot of time in chat. Yeah, right. And I think the reason for that is um, is because like while interfaces are nice and you can achieve a lot, um, there's still like a sort of like a diluted experience. Whereas with chat, it's so laser focused that, that you literally can't get anything wrong for it to be like a good experience. Yeah. So, um, I've just had a mental blank. <laughs> you tell me how great it was. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, like the other thing about chat is it's very natural and conversational. Like it's like you and me having a chat now, yeah. um, you're asking me about, you know, VR and chatbots, and I'm sort of giving you the answer. So I think it really mimics that, you know, real world, and I think Experience. That's, I think you, you touched on something there because I was really apprehensive to use that. Water? Yeah, please. And I was actually almost at this point where I was like, "Why is this business making me do this? Why can't you just put me on to someone?" You know, save money. <laughs> it's totally. But then, and I think that my mind, my, my I definitely changed my whole perception on what it was all about when I realized it's actually just really fast and easy. Yeah, and I've got the is. answers I need. I don't have to wait on a call for anyone or anything like that. And so, I guess I think that's a, a thing that. I don't know this, but I feel like a lot of people may struggle with the fact that there's this, why am I speaking to a computer when I just want to speak to a person? Yeah. You know? I, I think it's actually twofold. Like it does save the business money because they don't need to hire humans to answer all these questions, but the um, customer experience can really be improved as well. Like there's no wait times. Yeah. Um, and, you know, all the collective knowledge of all these humans uh, is sort of stored in like one brain. And um, on top of that, uh, it's like consistent emotions. Like sometimes someone might be having a bad day in the support center and you, they might get snappy at you and that'll never happen with a chat, but like um, a big part of like chat. No attitude. Yeah, no, no attitude. attitude, exactly. <laughs> They'll be cheeky maybe, but no attitude. Um, yeah. yeah, a big part of like building and designing a chatbot is the personality around it. So, um, so before we start a chatbot project, we actually like figure out who this bot is. Like what are they? like, what do they feel, what do they think, um, are they cheeky, um, you know, what are they trying to achieve. So it's almost, you like almost create that personality. Exactly. That, that, well, that's interesting as well because I guess then each brand or each business mm -hmm. will create it based on what they want their, I guess, customer to feel the experience from them, right? Yeah, exactly. That's cool. It's almost like creating them, like, you know, star support employee, like who they are, how they treat people and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that consistency is really good and yeah, it also allows you to do things extremely quickly without having to wait. Um, and that's not just like text-based chatbots, like um, like voice assistants now traditionally have been really bad. Like if you call up Telstra, you're like, please tell me in three words what you would like to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. we've um, all had that call before. <laughs> yeah, they're terrible. But um, with sort of AI coming into the picture, um, these chatbots can understand human language a lot better than they used to be able to. So you can talk to it in, you know, quite slang terms and it still understands. Like we're creating one for uh, a health insurance client yeah. and um, one of the basic, most common things they get is like wanting to change your address, right? 
Um, so typically, like someone will jump on the phone, wait in a queue for seven minutes. Um, they have to verify themselves, and then they say, "Okay, I want to change my address," and they have to, you know, say it on the phone, and they might not hear them properly, so they have to repeat it and then verify it. Um, but with a chatbot, um, we basically told it about ten different ways someone, um, you know, has the intent to change their address. Yeah. And after that, you could talk to it like missing letters and using like the number two instead of the word two, and it was like, "Cool, what do you want to update your address to?" So it just like picks up human language really easily. It's called like natural language processing. Yeah, that's cool. A little bit scary, like the way that it can do, like the way that we're, you're able to build it to be so yeah. human-like in a way, right? Um, and it's actually like standing on the shoulders of giants because all this uh, NLP stuff is actually Google pulling their Google Assistant out and like exposing it to third parties who want to build similar things. So you can actually use all the tools that um, are running like Siri and Hello Google and uh, Alexa you know, build your own products, okay. which is amazing. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the tech, uh, right? And I could talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> yeah. Don't be scared. Embrace. So I went off on a bit of a tangent then. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, one of the things that I hear, whether it be in this office, out on the street, um, you know, at a bar, whatever, it's this talk about Bitcoins, cryptocurrency. Like, I'm, I feel like I'm sort of in this space now where I yep. kind of get what it's about. Um, can you break it down for us, please? Yeah, definitely. What do you understand about it first? Very little. Okay. I, I, I get the fact that, you know, there was this idea, the way I understood it, the Bitcoin was created was a, the, so because people were fed up with having the banks be a middle person go to and yeah. they get that slice of the pie, right? So yeah. why not create a community where everyone can, in, in secrecy, um, transfer cash and not have to go through that process? Yep. That's how I understand it. I don't know how. Please tell, explain it properly, though, yeah. to the viewers. <laughs> yeah, no, you pretty much nailed it on the head. So after the 2008 uh, GFC, the global financial crisis, mm -hmm. um, this guy who could be a female as well, no one really knows who he is because he was under an alias, yeah. uh, called Satoshi Nakamoto, released like an eight-page white paper about how it's terrible that these central banks could cause this to happen and be the ones that come out on top and make billions of dollars out of this situation. Um, so using his background in cryptography, he devised a system whereby people could exchange uh, currency like person to person. So at the moment when you send money overseas, it goes from you to your bank to SWIFT, who's like an intermediary between them all, to their bank and then they have to go pick it up from their bank. Um, and what um, Bitcoin uh, does is allows you to do that, you know, straight to someone else. So it's really about this like idea of getting rid of this uh, centralized control over your money, which is like something that you should, you know, be able to have that's yours. Yeah. Because uh, like you know, in other countries, if you don't have money or if the government takes it away from you, it's really hard to get anywhere in life. You can't start your own business. You can't get out of anywhere. And Bitcoin sort of gives that control back to you. Um, so yeah, that's the idea behind it. Um, but to understand it, you need to decouple Bitcoin with the underlying technology because this is where things get interesting. Okay. So Bitcoin is just one out of about, it's got to be like one and a half thousand cryptocurrencies now. Wow, I didn't yeah. realize it was that many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So underneath Bitcoin is something called a blockchain. Um, and this is the technology that really interests me. Um, so the easiest way to describe it is like, uh, very slow public database. So it takes a while for things to go through it, um, but anyone can look at it and it's impossible to change. So... Um, Not even the best hacker in the world? No, hackers can't even get near it. So say you're going to buy a new car and you want to know the car history um, and how do you get that? You get like this huge stack of papers, with, like yeah. pink slips and like repair things and you don't know what's going on. Like someone could have put dodgy parts in, someone could have like spun the odometer backwards. Um, so the application of blockchain would be that like every time uh, this car gets taken in for service or every time it clocks in another kilometer, this bit of information gets stored in the blockchain. And so it's a public network that no one can change. So you can imagine over the lifetime of your car, this like history builds up, like had a crash here and like it's gone 100,000 kilometers. Um, and then when it comes back to you when you're ready to buy the car, you can just access this public database and look at absolutely All the info. everything, yeah. absolutely everything. So it, the best part about it is that it removes trust from a situation. So I trust the bank is going to send my money to the other bank overseas. Um, but with Bitcoin, you just don't have to worry about that at all. Okay. Cool. 
and and you've well, I mean there's people in, in our office um, who we're, we're watching it like mm -hmm. hawks Bitcoin in particular I mean it's like the, the speed almost at a point of hourly it's increase dizzying. right yeah it, it's 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 mind-blowing like what do you think? What, what's going to happen? Like, what's your experience? Have you, do, you, do you have an eight ball lying around? So I, can yeah. just give it a... I mean, give it a shake. <laughs> Who knows, right? But have you had much experience in it yourself personally? Yeah. So I first looked looked at it in 2013. Okay. And I bought a few back then, and it like kind of went up and then crashed. So I sold out then, and I probably had like 120 of them back then. And I'm devastated that I got rid of them because they would have been worth like one and a half million dollars at its current price oh, today. I was I was just thinking about like. Yeah, that, you're doing the maths in your yeah, head. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, then about a year ago is when I sort of picked, like, got on my radar again. Okay. And um, I was researching, as I said, there's multiple cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin's the main one that everyone knows. Yeah. Um, but then the next biggest one's called Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go into detail on that one because that's really interesting as well. All right. Um, and then the next one is Litecoin. So Bitcoin's like gold, Litecoin is like silver. Yeah. And then Ethereum is like oil. Okay. Um, so yeah, I got in probably like six to eight months ago. I've been enjoying it, but I'm also really terrified at the moment because I just have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, no one does, right? No, That's no. The... I don't know. I'm, don't take any advice from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I have but, no doubt there's going to be questions like, yeah. can we put money in? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think the biggest thing is just to do your research. Yeah. Um, so I probably read like, I don't know five to ten articles every day on Medium um, about like the blockchain and Bitcoin, and yeah. um, you can just subscribe to different topics, and your newsfeed will fill with all these like really well-written, opinionated articles. Yeah. And yeah, sorry, who was that again? Uh, Medium.com. Medium.com. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic. It's sort of like, it's actually interestingly, it's a company built by Twitter. Yeah. It does really short messages, but yeah. it encourages long form. So it's okay. like a blog, social network kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've, so I've been reading quite a lot about it in the past like six months it's been very bullish and everyone's extremely excited and they're like oh my god I'm gonna be a millionaire in a couple of weeks yeah 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 I feel like I've really missed out on this yeah um, but the more I'm reading now the sentiment is sort of like shifting a little bit from like this is amazing to like the world's gone nuts um, so I don't know I'm getting on the fence but I could be wrong it could like double and triple and just keep going up forever yeah. I hope it does Every, everyone involved would be stoked yeah I, I mean I, I remember when I first heard about it and I, I kicked myself about this I heard about it a really long time ago yeah. from a friend of mine who was like I've got this mate and he's like a mad conspiracy theorist guy. and he's like says this is going to be the way of the future and I'm like this sentence didn't start well with I've got a yeah. conspiracy theorist yeah, friend just disc um, right, yeah. but, <laughs> straight away. Then, but it turns out this, you know these guys put in early and now they're just watching and I think that there's a part of me that I, I you know I watch the, the updates and so on and yeah. I just think like it's going up at such a rapid like where else have you ever seen anything that you could invest into yeah, and well. then in literally tulips yeah tulips <laughs> the only other example right we yeah. don't know how that ended yeah but that one one example to go I can put money in on Wednesday and then by you know Tuesday the following week have made cash on it you know could have or it could disappear or it could have just gone but yeah it, yeah I mean I, it's very intriguing so to put it into perspective though. Uh, during the dot-com bubble in 2000, um, six trillion dollars US dollars of value was lost in like the space of a week or a month. I can't remember how long it took to crash. Yeah. Um, and at the moment, uh, Bitcoin's market, uh, sorry, the entire cryptocurrency market cap uh, is only at like half a trillion dollars. So it's still like, still could run up, you know, another six, seven, eight times or, you know, it could go bust. But um, Institutional investors have just entered the game, so for the first time, people on Wall Street can, um, you know, short or long um, what, what Bitcoin's price is going to be. Mm -hmm. So you can buy a future, which is like I think at this time in the future, Bitcoin's going to be at this price. Okay. Um, and obviously, if it goes down, um, you can lose your money. If it goes up, you can get your money. It's like betting, um, but that's got like this huge influx of new cash that's sort of ready to pounce on it, ready to get into the game. Um, so I think from that and this is just there's not advice um <laughs> yeah go yeah, on but i'm gonna be like i got that advice yeah <laughs> no no no, <laughs> no, no, I'm no not, promises i'm not liable here. no promises here don't come knocking on my door yeah <laughs> um, we'll send out our personal information later. Yeah. Directly, it's fine. Yeah. um but yeah i think because there's this, still this huge rush of institutional money that's on yeah. its way i think it could continue to go up 
okay. a bit more. Um, but then within like 12 to 24 months, I imagine it would crash. Because the thing is, is like you can put, like everyone's putting all this money into it, but then like what do you, what do you use it for? Yeah. Um, there's like one startup in Australia that um, I've got some Bitcoin in um, called Coinjar, and they actually send you like a debit card that you can access your Bitcoin funds with. Okay. But the thing about that is like the whole, it goes against the whole idea of um, Bitcoin is that we don't need this like paper fiat money. Um, whereas I think all these people rushing in when it, like the price starts to wobble, they're going to want to get their money back. Um, but the whole idea is that you don't need that money with Bitcoin. Like the price shouldn't matter if you know, you're like truly invested in the Bitcoin. Yeah. Which I'm not, yeah. I'm definitely not like, I'm still like, I'm <laughs> Are we clear right now. Yeah. 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 But, um, yeah, I think when people realize they're like, sweet, it's all gone up and then it starts going down and they don't really have any utility for it. Like there's a few websites you can buy off. I think Amazon except Bitcoin. Okay. Um, but like day to day, you know, going to buy a coffee. Um, Cause there's like transaction fees. So every time you send some Bitcoin to someone. Um, Someone's getting a clip there. Yeah, yeah. And that sort of, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, that's sort of how like mining Bitcoins works. Um, right. The people who are, confirming that these transactions are real um, obviously need some motivation to confirm that to use yeah. other computing power and that's where the fee comes from. Ah, I did um, wonder that how that bit works. So it yeah. Um, so if you go and buy a $4 coffee, um, the transaction fee would be about $25 at yeah. the moment. So, but that's when like Litecoin and Ethereum come in, their transaction fees are way lower um, and yeah, they've got a whole bunch of different uses. Cool. Have you heard of um, you know, Ethereum and Litecoin and Ripple and... I, I, but I've only heard recently, uh, yeah. just because like, like you hear these things, like better Google this, see what, what, <laughs> what I'm missing out on here. Yeah, um, yeah. But look, thank you for bringing us to speed with, with that. That's very, very useful information. No worries. Sure there's a lot of people at home taking notes. Um, uh, if you want to get into it, um, go to Coinjar for Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, actually, Coinbase to buy Bitcoin, Ethereum and um, what's the other one? Litecoin. Um, and then once you bought them there, send them to Coinjar if you want your swipe card. Um, and you can also hedge your money. So if you think it's going to go down, you can put it into like Australian dollars while it fluctuates and then put it back into Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Coinbase is a really good place to start. Cool. But once you buy it on there, if you really get into it, set up your own wallet on your computer. Because um, if you buy with Coinbase, they hold your Bitcoins for you. Um, but once again, it goes against uh, the whole idea of Bitcoin because it's centralized, like one person's holding onto all this money. So you want to get it onto your computer. So it's yours. And if they go down or they get hacked or anything, all your coins are safe. And as I say, only commit what you're willing to lose. Yes, exactly. That That's what rule. I tell everybody. That's golden rule. Um, so look, a lot of information there, like many different things. And it makes me kind of bring back to a kind of a, a question that's on my mind as a, I guess, as a director of an agency, what does, what does your day to day look like? Yeah. Um, like, actually what I do. Yeah, like what's, I mean, well, you've given us so many pieces of great information there. I'm sure people at home go, so what exactly does his day look like? Yeah, um, I think it's good to like start your day fresh and um, early, you know, get up early, even if it means going to bed earlier um, and do a bit of exercise before you get into work because um, what I hate getting the tram to work is seeing people like zombies, like they're holding on with like a coffee in their hand, yeah. still falling asleep. Um, yeah, I think if you do a bit of exercise. So you go for runs or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. I try to go for a run most days before work. Yeah. doesn't always, I do sleep through my alarm some days. <laughs> Don't we all? Not a superhuman. Guilty, guilty. <laughs> um, I actually wrote a blog post about all the stuff that, you know, I try to do every morning yeah. um, to sort of get your brain ready. Okay. Um, but yeah, I try to get in about seven or eight o'clock just to get a head start on everything. The office is super quiet then, which is nice. Um, and then, yeah, I just sort of get into it. Um, we've got like a stand up with our team every morning where we just go through all the projects that are going on. Aren't they fantastic? We, they we've implemented those here as well um, as a group and then as, as smaller teams and they just really, it's a great way to start the morning. I think it just gets everyone across everything. Yeah. And if people are having trouble with something, they're vocal about it. Or we encourage people like at the end of every stand up, I'm like, who's having problems? What can I help people with? Like all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I find like, you know, people can get stuck and go down this like rabbit hole in their head. Um, so yeah, they're definitely super helpful. Um, and then I really just get into it. There's a whole like slew of different things we do. Um, spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, sort of like building the company profile and, yeah. um, you know, finding new projects and that sort of thing. Um, I try to write quite a lot just to once again, build, you know, the company profile around what we do. I've been writing about chatbots heaps recently. Yeah. Um, cause that's sort of like what we're focusing on at the moment. 
Um, and then, yeah, if anyone needs help with like coding or designing something, um, I love it when we get to do workshops. So we have a problem and we get into a room. We've got this massive wall-to-wall -wall whiteboard. And, um, yeah, just like talk about the problem, um, you know, write up what the user stories might be and then sort of, you know, like just sketch it out quickly on the whiteboard. Um, go to client meetings, um, spend a lot of time emailing clients. Um, what else? Uh, going out for lunch with the team, just trying to keep them happy. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a yeah. bit of everything. It's funny, like when we got the team sounds on. Like, <laughs> your day sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, I try to make it awesome. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, when we got the team on board, it just sort of like switched from me doing all the work, like the, all the coding and all the designing to like sort of managing all the designing and all the coding. Yeah. Um, so that was quite a like challenging transition for me just because it wasn't what I used to like. I've been writing code and designing things for uh, it was probably like nine or ten years yeah. when this all happened. Um, so I'm still like figuring out how to like <clears throat> manage my time properly and, you know, focusing on things and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's really just a bit of everything, just making sure the wheels keep turning and there's new work coming in and all that sort of thing. So I, I'd love to know like what what are some of the things that you would have loved to have learned when you were at university that you kind of had to pick up yourself and people management yeah hiring and firing that's probably been the biggest challenge yeah. if you don't do one right you're gonna to have to do the other one yeah. um and vice versa of course um probably time management's a huge one like that would just be invaluable to know how to make the most out of your day like make all your hours productive um, cause, because there's so much stuff to do, I spend a lot of time switching mental context. So I'll be working on one thing and then something will come up and I'll have to like switch to that. And they've done studies and it takes your brain like 15 minutes to adjust to a situation. So if you're like switching this context, like every 20 minutes or every five minutes, you just don't perform at your peak. Um, yeah, I think productivity is a huge one. Like if you have like a mental framework around how to do things in a, you know, really good sort of, you know, time period, um, and how not to like waste too long on things, that sort of thing. That's a huge one. Um, what else has been a challenge? All the accounting stuff and legal stuff. We just hired, hired someone to do all that. <laughs> no one to outsource sounds like a good yeah, thing. Yeah, to oh, yeah. Out, outsourcing is a huge one. Yeah. Um, we brought on like an offshore team uh, right at the start just because yeah. it's cost effective and they're really good at what they do. Um, and I went through, I've, oh, and since I've been doing this, I've probably been through like, 50 to 60 contractors like both teams and individuals mm -hmm. and it's very much an art picking the right person for it you know how to like ask the right questions and like you yeah, know unicorn. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> no but people like because it can um it's probably such a cutthroat market people yeah. do lie about what they can do so you right. really need to be experienced in like you know knowing what those lies can be and looking through their work and yeah. you know figuring out whether they are who they say they are and what they are capable of and that sort of thing and then um, also whether they're like a cultural fit, like whether, you know, they're the right personality to join a team. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's mainly all the soft skills, I would say, that yeah. I would, would, would have liked to have learned before I started this. Yeah, interesting. Um, Matilda, would you please, I, know, I can see you've been writing down questions over <laughs> here. So I already for, those through. Who, for those who have submitted them, we will now get to some of those. Awesome. Let's do this. Do we get names as well? No, no, no. All anonymous. No names. All anonymous. You know who you are. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us more about what your what about your agency and what you do? Sure. So the way we like to um, describe it is we're an emerging technology agency. Okay. Um, so we sort of wanted to break away from the whole creative technology thing. Uh, sorry, I like you know creative and development thing and sort of broaden it up. Um, so we like to say we like solve old problems in new ways. Okay. And another way to say that is we put jetpacks on dinosaurs. Nice. Um, yeah. So we look at like problems that, you know, sort of corporates and larger companies are having and figure out how we can apply these new technologies like chatbots and blockchain and VR, um, you know, to the problems they're having. So um, a good example was um, the domestic violence charity White Line came to us and they were like, hey, we've got this charity event and we want you guys to do like a website so, you know, people can learn about it and, you know, get involved in that sort of thing. And um, we went back to them and we were like, is another website really uh, the best way to sort of, you know, solve this problem of creating empathy around this issue? Mm -hmm. um, so we went back and we were like, hey, why don't we use VR to create a scene, um, you know, where the viewer is in a domestic violence situation? 
Um, and they thought it was great. And it's really scary. Like you put it on and you're like sitting as a kid in this like family with mum at home yeah. and dad walks in drunk and like starts throwing things and like punching mum. And um, I think the goal was to, it's bad, but it was to like get more donations and it worked. Like yeah. it was way better, way more um, engaging. And like, I think a few people cried as well, which like, you know, isn't something to cheer about, but you know, it's good that, you know, we had the impact that they were after, which I don't yeah. think like a website could achieve. No, and I think that that sounds like what you're able to do is like bring to life some of the realists, the, the, I guess the reality around something so heavy and yeah. then, you know, I guess give that to the other people to experience. And then I can imagine that would have been a heavy piece of work. Yeah, it was. Yeah. We, but, filmed, we had to go through like 10 takes as well. So I kind of got numb to it after a while because I know what's coming and that yeah. sort of thing. But like to people who are showing it, you put it on and they'd be sitting down, you like see them like jumping, this kind of thing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. But wow. the first few times it's so full on, like we could watch the takes while they were happening and they were like swinging punches. It was crazy. Oh wow. Okay, next question, you ready? Yep. Do you think we are becoming too dependent on technology? Um, yeah, probably, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think technology is gonna augment our life in so many ways that we probably don't even know yet. And yeah. I think it's probably good to embrace it instead of, uh, you know, be against it and try to be old fashioned because like the world's going to keep moving regardless. And all these innovations are here to solve your problems, not to cause you pain or detriment or anything. Yeah. So, um, yeah, embrace it. I think it's important to speak to people like yourself because I'm a bit old school and I would get like chat box was a perfect example. I was like, I'm not ready for this. I don't want to deal with this. And then I experienced and I'm like, it's not so bad. Yeah. It's actually kind of yeah. good. So it's, it's all designed because like humans have problems, like all these new things that are coming out is because we've got these problems that we don't know how to solve. So we're yeah. just solving them in creative ways and yeah, giving it out to the masses for everyone to enjoy their life better. Cool. Uh, next question. Mm -hmm. What kind of skills do you think will be in high demand in the future? That's a tough question to answer. Um, <laughs> I think all this, like an interesting thing, and it's been the case throughout history, but all these new technological advancements that are happening always create new jobs. Okay. Um, so there's always going to be, um, you know, like with AI, for example, there's only like 100,000 people in the world who can actually create a complex um, artificial intelligence system. So there's this huge hole where like massive companies like Google, are like scooping all these people up. Um, but that's obviously like quite a complex one. Yeah. I think uh, probably looking at like, service workers like factory things and uh, restaurants and like chefs and that sort of thing will probably be start to be automated um anything that's repetitive like crunching numbers like accountants yeah um also probably gonna um you know go out the door even um i came across this chatbot the other day called joey or jeff i think it was and it's a legal chatbot so like you tell it what your problem is and it puts the documents together for you and asks you all the right questions and spits out a pdf at the end for like your legal wow. document that is a game changer. Yeah. And um, there's another one that um, processes a legal document and pulls out all the insights, yeah. like all the important things that you should know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anything that's like can be automated probably will be automated. So it's really like how to either manage that automation or create new ways on new opportunities in that area. Cool. So I didn't really have any specific skills in, but I saw it was sort of like a general. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Few people got worried. All the accountants listening. <laughs> um, okay, two last questions. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this is a good one. When you were younger, how did you know how much to charge your clients? I have no idea, and I still have no idea. Um, Just I, send an invoice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, no, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I I think it's an intrinsic human thing to okay. always undervalue yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so my general rule of thumb was figure out what I wanted to get from it, okay. and then times it by one point five. And I've, people have never even scoffed at it. They might try to negotiate just because people always negotiate, but yeah. they negotiate at this price or that price. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just talk to people. And I think after a while, you also get a feel for, you know, what you should be charging for your services and what's acceptable and that sort of thing. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's an intrinsic human thing to undervalue yourself. So bear that in mind next time you're writing an invoice or a quote and yeah, just give yourself a little bonus on top. Good advice. Yeah. Okay, last question. Oh, this is a great question. Uh, do you offer internships at your agency? We do actually. Um, yeah, uh, for everything. For um, everything? Uh, yeah, like design, dev. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so pretty much all our team onshore, they've all been interns. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I think we really love interns because they're hungry yeah. for knowledge and um, they're really passionate about what they do. And we've hired someone in the past who was, uh, you know, a straight hire and they just don't have the passion that the interns have. And like Harrison and Jonathan and men, they just shine so much compared to like the guy who's like jaded because he's been in the industry for so long and yeah. that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, drop me an email. You're going to share yeah, my yeah, details. Of course we will. We and will. if you have any questions, just email oh, me as well. One last question. Nice. Very um, uh, what one skill should I work on to be a greater employee for your organization? Let me think about this one. Um, Great question. Yeah. I'm trying to think about what's one thing that I like most in my employees. I'd have to say like creative thinking, like thinking outside the box and coming up with new ways to solve a problem because everything you do is inherently a problem yeah. and there's millions of people trying to solve the same problem as well. So if you can come up with, you know, that's something that sort of like might use a different tool or goes about in a different way, but like creative brainstorming and thinking is like really important. Cool. And uh, yeah, just not, don't waste anyone's time. No time wasters, creative thinking. There you Excellent. go. That's it. Um, I do want to do one last thing before, right, before, we, a, yeah. before cool. we jet off. Um, we always do a little bit of a, a game in these entrepreneurs with the Sir sessions. Yours. Hello. What the am city. I doing? Stay there. Stay there. Right. Stay there. Um, we do have three prizes. If you yeah. Know right. correct. Cool. The first is a bottle of wine. I love wine. The second. <laughs> Is a bag of legitimate bitcoins. Nice. These are real. Ooh, so that um, must be about 500 grand. It's there? about 500 Gs there. there so then we also have an apple from the communal fruit box that we have uh, in the office. All right. Is this a psychological game? No, it's not. <laughs> you, if you can hit 20 on there, you can choose right, whichever right. ever of these amazing gifts that we have. And I, I've got five chances? Yes, you do. All right, cool. Where is 20? No, oh, get okay, to twenty. That, okay. that was the first test. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. Oh, how many you got left? Does that count? Is that like six we, plus nine? We, 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 <laughs> we, we may give you that. So I'm fifteen. I need to get a five. Yeah. Oh, oh. nice. It's nine. Oh. oh. <laughs> you saw that? If you could see that up close, it literally almost went over the edge and then landed on the eleven. So I think do the mass. That's that's well over twenty. That's excellent. Sweet. Okay, grab a seat. And because of that, and also because we know it's your birthday tomorrow, mm -hmm. you are able to have all these Amazing. gifts. Amazing. Thank you so much, Oscar. Holly, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Cheers. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a pleasure uh, for those for me at home. Too. Thank you for joining us in our last episode for the year. We're back in Jan. Um, have a have a great holiday break, and um, feel free to send us any questions. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. See you all soon. Bye. See you soon. Oh, yours. <laughs> oh, yours. <laughs>